Hey, what is up, everybody? Uh, back with another LFA a breakdown. Aaron the dog here with his phone not on vibrate uh, or silent. So, uh, anyways, uh, back a little bit early. I said that I was going to be back with the LFA after my UFC breakdown, actually, uh, before uh, we're going. So, uh, we are live here as uh, if you are joining me live a couple hours early here with my. LFA co-host, as always, Lucky Locks Picks. How are you doing uh, this afternoon, not evening? Yeah, I'm doing great, man. Uh, excited to get into these fights. It's a pretty pretty good card, and especially at the main event, it's a real good fight. Uh, you don't get a guy with, with the type of resume like you see for me too often on these regional shows, so this should be a fun one to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Just before we get too much further uh, into this, uh, I definitely think the LFA is in the juicy A for Omega business this weekend because if they can have that happen, I mean, who's next? Pantoja? Like, who's going to come to LFA next? Who's like, I need to go the Moreno route and uh, <laughs> restart my career. Um, I think it's going to, I think it's kind of interesting though because, I mean, when Moreno did this, the LFA looked a lot different than it does today. Um, so I think that, uh, We'll definitely talk about that main event. The main event's quite intriguing, though. Um, for Miga going against uh, uh, Felipe Silva, also known as Felipe uh, Filipino, Felipe Buenas. Buenas, is it? Buenas, I believe. I'll say Bunas. Bunas. I could be wrong. Yeah, I like Filipino, personally. Uh, that's his like nickname that seems to show up on a lot of his fights. So, um, But either way, uh, it's not kind of this automatic, like, oh, he's facing someone from the LFA now. But we'll get to that. Uh, when we get to that, I think it's a really intriguing uh, top two fights, though. Clayton Carpenter Absolutely. versus uh, Vincent Hamos. So another – both of these fights I think are really exciting. It's kind of a unofficial, like, flyweight, uh, kind of like an unofficial flyweight Grand Prix. They did it with the middleweight Grand Prix a while ago. Uh, Josh Fremd getting a big win this past weekend over my boy Joel Bauman. Uh, my boy. I bet against Bauman in this spot. It was very, very – uh, painful to see my pet, pet come through, but I did let the money kind of allow me a little bit of comfort. But I mean, that was a pick 'em fight. Josh Friend looked absolutely fantastic in that fight. Again, um, lost to uh, Gregory Rodriguez, and I mean, looking at what Rodriguez is doing, he's getting ready to fight in a couple weeks. I think Rodriguez is like top tier prospect in the 185 division, honestly. So. Um, just good stuff all the way around for LFA lately. These Grand Prix, I think, definitely get results. That was my long-winded way of saying that. Um, just checking around real quick. I just need to grab a marker or a pen to write down my timestamps, and then I'm ready to go. But, uh, yeah, Lucky, uh, tell them about what is on your channel. Um, I believe that you have a breakdown on so Just let the people know where they can find a much more succinct breakdown than my long-winded one here. Yeah, you guys can find me on uh, YouTube, Lucky Locks Picks. I'm on Twitter, at Lucky Locks Picks, like you can just see in the picture here. And I got my LFA breakdown up there, talking about the same uh, stuff that we're going to be talking about today, but a little bit more discourse on this show, a little bit more uh, discussion-based and uh, less kind of straightforward. So uh, both of them have their benefits for sure, and uh, today we'll have some good discussions about these fighters. Yeah, I, and I definitely think they do both. Uh, I, that's why I kind of wanted to point that out is I do think both really have their benefit. I always go and listen to your uh, information after our discussions uh, and while I'm making kind of my final decisions too. Um, it is kind of the same type of information, but it, you get kind of a little bit of different read when you're talking to somebody. Um, I try to avoid on this channel having a lot of solo breakdowns. Um, it's just kind of tough, um, but – uh, you know, either way, and then visceral seeing uh putting you on the spot here asking if you're hanging around for the UFC breakdown or not. I'm not sure if you are, but uh, you always got a spot. But I think that he's taken off, but I'll let him you can take that one from visceral. Yeah, unfortunately, fellas, today I'm not going to be able to, but I'd love to get in. You know, I can make yeah. a couple guest appearances for sure in the future. I'm definitely not going to rule that out. Yeah, and we're done. And we're, I mean, it's 100% he's going to be covering the PFL at least challenger series with me. Oh, yeah. Just the whole Big PFL, time. but he'll make it eventually, eventually visceral. Not everybody has like just like three, four hours to just talk about 42 different fighters and all in a row. Uh, I'm just not normal. And, uh, you know, I also run a business where, as you hear from time to time, I work with dogs, so they're quite understanding uh, with what I do. But without further ado, we're five minutes in, and uh, I've talked about zero fights, so 
I'm going to go ahead and, you know, at the five minute mark, that's going to be for my timestamp. Uh, we're covering the main card as always. Um, the day we start covering the uh, LFA prelims is, you know, a day I really need to get some help. Although, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a couple guys on the prelims usually. This one, uh, Braden Payoga, I know of. Otherwise, I've never even heard of anybody on the prelims. So uh, definitely maybe getting some new stars. You kind of see this with uh, LFA that they really do develop their guys so that they're not just getting on main cards for the most part with no um, kind of experience within LFA. And I really appreciate that. Um, first fight of the night, it is in the bantamweight division. Uh, the 30 year old prospect out fight ready MMA, which is a camp we're seeing a ton of lately. Uh, I really do feel like fight ready every single card. I'm breaking out one or two guys from fight ready. Uh, take out rogue combat Academy two and three, uh, fighter Tristan Lindy here, uh, two and three, uh, both guys, five, seven, both, uh, you know, not huge, huge one thirty fivers. Uh, Tanner, certainly the larger of the two, uh, better pro record, but Tristan, uh, Lindy will start with, um, he's going to be, he's going to have a little, he's definitely going to have a smaller reach, uh, for sure. Even though they are the same height, um, but 25 years old, good striker. Both his wins are coming by knockout against, uh, plus records. He's actually faced all plus records in his career, which is kind of cool to see. I'll uh, be at a one and L on one of those losses, uh, John Duma in his last fight back in November, he lost by Dars Choke. John Duma has a couple good wins in Bellator, has a win over Mike Kimball, who once in, once in a blue moon was like that uber prospect. I don't know if anybody remembers the Mike Kimball prospect days, but uh, yeah, those are long behind us now. Kimball's had a couple losses over with uh, Bellator, but that was a good one. And Duma, he, he's solid. He's not uh, like amazing. Uh, Arnold Jimenez, not as familiar with. Uh, and then as an amateur, he went 5-0, and though, uh, and did have, you know, submission wins in his amateur career. So there is the possibility he's a little more well-rounded than his pro career is let off. He's got the wrestling shirt on and the tapology picture. And, uh, you know, CES, not a bad promotion, King of the Cage also. So has some decent um, experience here uh, and still only 25 years old. So maybe a little bit of a rough start to the career, but um, either way. Uh, Casey Tanner, so far I've really liked what I've seen from him over the CFFC. Um, says he's a kung fu fighter. Uh, Ten straight wins going back to his amateur career. Um, and, you know, has a few submission wins, has a knockout, uh, pretty well-rounded. Hasn't faced a crazy level of competition. Actually has faced less fighters with a winning record than his opponent. Um, and as an amateur, got a few submission wins. Also got a... Got a few finishes by KO, so he seems pretty well-rounded. Got to watch the CFFC fights. Um, you know, got the knockout against Calvin Harbaugh. Uh, looked pretty good. Terry Bartholomew went to the decision. Seemed like he carried a good pace. Looks to be good enough. Um, this isn't one I'm looking to bet uh, too heavily, but uh, if I had to take a side, I'd take Tanner, but I think he's very, very over um, overpriced in this spot, but he should be able to take this one. Um, but I'm just curious, you know, to see how good Lindy is. He's faced good competition throughout his career. So, like, again, I think that the price when I see a minus 700, uh, that's just, I mean, there's very few fighters I'm taking at that price, and Casey Tanner is not on that list. So Casey Tanner is my official pick. My official bet is not a. Yeah, this is uh, – you kind of hit on Tristan Lindy. I mean, he's fought some pretty good guys. He's a mm -hmm. lot better than what you would expect out of a two and three, you know, fighter uh, mm -hmm. because most of those fights have been against good guys. You know, you, you shouted out John Duma there. Like, it's kind of a tough matchup as well. And uh, he was 5-0 and oh as an amateur with an 80% finish rate and just has kind of had a bit of a rocky start to the pro career. But he's been in there with really good guys. Um, he has been submitted in two out of the three losses. Uh, but in his two wins, he has two knockouts. So he has good striking, and uh, he has a pretty short reach. I believe it's 62 inches. That's what they had him listed at the last uh, CES. So His arms really yeah. look short in his fights, too. He looks yeah. like a flyweight, potentially. So Yeah. And, Tanner's uh, big. You know, he's shown the ability to finish guys with strikes, but I just don't see him having that much success at range, not necessarily because I 
don't like his striking game just because Tanner has kind of shown like, you know, he's really quick. He's really uh, slick in the pocket. He'll get out of the way, has that high guard and just good awareness on defense. And he's able to kind of get out of the way a lot, block a lot of incoming attacks. Tanner, you know, he doesn't have a ton of of volume on the feet from what I've seen, but he is going to come forward. He is going to try to pressure you against the cage, uh, has pretty good low kicks. He's got good takedown defense of his own and really good. You know, once he does get guys to the ground, passes guard, he does damage. He looks for submissions and, that's where he looks the best. That's where he does his best work. Just really good, really good top game. Um, and we've seen uh, Lindy have a little bit of trouble with grapplers before. You know, he is liable to be submitted. Been subbed in two of his three losses, like I said. And uh, he was also a submission machine, though, on the on the amateur circuit. He did have right. really good chokes there. But I got to trust the fight ready product to get it done. I think he is just a better all around fighter here. But yeah, you know, when I originally was taping this fight, it was around minus six fifty. Now around minus seven hundred. It's just nothing that. I want to be involved in. And like you said, it, I don't know. He just doesn't look like a minus 700 favorite. To no. Me, but yeah. I'm a, Casey Tanner. Yeah. I'm a little surprised at that. Um, yeah. Plus 500 on Lindy. It's just so tempting to just put down like a quarter of a unit, something where it's just like, yeah, like, you know, if it, but I'm going to just avoid it. I'm just going to leave this alone. But uh, I do think, you know, this last week, our biggest odds, I think we're like minus 240 on the whole card. Uh, and we start out with a minus 700 uh, here. And there's a couple pretty slanted odds here. I mean, the LFA is playing on more and more cards. We're going to see this more and more. I mean, the UFC is having trouble at times putting uh, a few of the matchups I'm going to talk about today with the UFC. It's kind of funny with, too. So um, next matchup here, uh, this is a guy I really do like uh, quite a bit in a Jacoby Jones Uh much to the chagrin of, I believe it was Lance Paxton's father. Uh, our last breakdown, he did not care for how little of a chance I was giving Lance Paxton. And uh, I told him in the comments, and, uh, you know, it was more about how I felt about Jacoby Jones. Uh, I really do like what I've seen so far out of him. Um, I think this is a really interesting fight, though, and uh, one that, you know, he's got to be careful of basically one thing. I'm going to make it pretty simple here. Uh if he chooses to wrestle, he's got to avoid an arm bar. That's it. Like, otherwise, he's, I think Jacoby Jones is going to just be able to take him down, keep position. Um, one thing I'll say with Jacoby is he doesn't go for the finish too much, which, um, you know, is something I would like to see him improve on a little more in his career. But at this point, position over submission against a guy who basically is an arm bar or bust in Austin Verms, um, you know, I mean, that's really how I kind of see this fight. And if it's on the feet, I think Jacoby has an advantage in the stand-up also. Um, so this definitely, I think, could be the type of fight where we see Jacoby test the stand-up a little more. Um, you know, and, I mean, again, Verms is going to pull guard or something to try to get an arm bar, I think. I really do. Otherwise, I don't see Verms' path to victory. I think Jacoby Jones is going to be on the contender series. I don't know if he'll win his contender series fight when he gets there. But I think he'll be he, – that's, like, the path he's on. A couple more wins in LFA, and, you know, he's probably got, like, a Dakota Bush kind of ceiling, which I know isn't huge, huge praise there. But until I kind of see the full game rounded out, which an opponent like this, he could show more of his game, and that could give me a little more of a sure optimism moving forward. But either way, I think this is Jacoby Jones all day. Um, if he does wrestle him, I just think he's going to be very cautious of his arm position. Otherwise, he should be all good. I don't think there's much more to look at. Yeah, I'm seeing this one pretty similarly to you. Um, Austin Verms, you know, it just I think there are a couple holes in the stand-up that could potentially be exploited here, um, specifically with the striking defense a little bit. But he does have a really good jiu-jitsu game. All four wins have come by submission. Uh, and But, you know, he can be taken down and doesn't really seem to mind being on his back because – he gets to fish for that armbar, like you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, Jacoby Jones, that is the number one thing to look out for because Verms can grab that really quickly and just kind of mm-hmm. surprisingly just pull the win out of nowhere. Uh, I think Jacoby Jones is going to be a little bit of a sterner test in that aspect just because I feel like his overall wrestling in top game is a little bit better than the guys that uh, Verms has been able to do that against. But you really always got to be aware when you go to the ground with them. Um, Jacoby Jones, on the other hand, I think that he has the cleaner stand up here. I, I, I do like him on the feet. I think he's more defensively responsible. Um, and I think, you know, he is a really good wrestler too. He's definitely going to be mind, going to need to be mindful of that arm bar, but I think Jones is going to have some success on the feet. 
And like you said, we might see a little bit more of his game in this one. And I might even take it a step further and say that he might even be better off just to stand in this one because I feel like he does have quite a market advantage there. And uh, if he does go to the ground, I feel like he might just be giving Worms even uh, a, a better chance to win mm-hmm. by just giving him the opportunity to try to find that arm bar. But I think Jones is the better striker. I think he's the better wrestler too. Got to be careful of the subs, but uh, I think Jones is just a better fighter here. And I think he wins this one and improves to 4-0. Yeah, no, I would love to get the same that I don't have to use the wrestling. I'd be more in t- more encouraged to kind of see that just, you know, as long as it doesn't carry on to too many fights. Minus 360 on Jones, plus 285 on Verms. Um, Jones will be in one or two of my parlays, um, but that's about it. And honestly, I will be holding my breath when he takes it down at any point just because it is just – Something that I don't think Verms needs a lot of energy to pull off. I think he's very just comfortable with arm bars. So for the most part, it's going to, I think, cost him more than it's going to, you know, result in wins, which is why the record's where it's at. But it's always there. So, um, you know, and we did kind of see with uh, Jones, albeit I think Paxton looked really good in that fight. He was kind of pushed towards the end of the, you know, the end part of that fight. So we did see a little bit of potential cardio issues with Jones. So. Uh, definitely curious there, but yeah, I mean, I like Jones, 25 years old still. He's got the Conor McGregor tattoo, uh, you know, not making all the right choices, but mostly right choices. So can't judge him too hard for that. His nickname is Big Toe, which is weird. Um, yeah, I think he goes to 4-0, though. Uh, we're going to move on to the next fight. This is a just a, a weird heavyweight fight um, here. Uh, we've got... The uh, what, what was it? Was he one time Bellator um competitor yeah, was, in Walter? Just I think on, so, yeah, just the one time, yeah, you know, and he looked pretty good there. He uh got the win over PFL, long time PFL fighter, and Mo de Um, I thought we got to see quite a bit of uh Waldo's game in that uh fight, and I actually appreciated it just from an information standpoint as to um uh, how he reacts to kind of the takedown pressure, the grappling pressure, um, and all that. So, um, you know, for the most part, it looks like, you know, pretty good specimen there uh, going against a 7-7 seven and seven fighter. So seems that uh, LFA, once in a while, they get into the squash business a little bit. Um, and it seems like, in a way, they kind of are there with Derek Weaver, uh, the Michigan product 7-7. Seven and seven. Uh, fighting out Grand Rapids MMA. I am originally from Michigan, so always interested in the Michigan products, but often they look like Harry Hunt sucker, unfortunately. So um, the Dream Weaver, which always original nickname uh, used there. Uh, lot, one last fight back in October. It was against a 4-2 or or fighter, uh, 1 in 30, 1 37 seconds, or 27 seconds. Uh, before that, lost to Chandler Cole, who I've been able to watch quite a bit. Um, he's he's not all that great, but again, like he's got losses to guys like Chandler Cole, who did have a five and two record. Brett Martin early in his career. Brett Martin um, is Brett Martin still like the next heavyweight prospect that people are talking about, or or people off the Brett Martin is a heavyweight prospect. I I lose track because I know yeah, I, mean, I know it's, it's hard to keep up. Yeah, I know for a while he was like a potential heavyweight prospect. Then he had like the weird fight with Ferreira where he faked, I think, the injury when he was losing. And then everybody kind of calmed down on it. But uh, yeah, Brent Martin, good wrestler. So, I mean, decent, you know, Leroy Johnson back in the day. Uh, you know, I mean, these are, these are you know, kind of random heavyweights, but he's faced quite a few of them. Um, lost by finish most of, in all of his losses, so... Seven losses, seven finishes, mostly by strikes here. Uh, Walter Cortez Acosta, I mean, it's, I'm not going to put a whole lot of thought into this. I think this is set up for Walter. Um, Waldo here, um, you know, his record kind of goes all over the place depending on the, the site you're on. He's won uh, three straight in MMA. He went to boxing for a while. Um, I mean, good stand-up for the most part. Um, gone to a decision his last couple – However, but, yeah, I think that he gets a finish of some sort on Derek Weaver here. Uh, Maddie, good to have you here. Thanks for checking out the – but, yeah, I think I think Waldo takes this. It's just not one I'm looking to bet too heavily. 
Yeah, man. Waldo Cortez Acosta, 4 0 fighter out of Arizona. Big guy, 6'4, 78 inch reach. And uh, Mo Reese beat him on Bellator back in November. That's a pretty good win, man. You know, like as far as Bellator prelim matchups mm-hmm. go, that's one of the better ones, I'd say. Um, in terms of the boxing, I think he has pretty decent MMA boxing. He has 10 pro boxing bouts where he was 6 and 4. Uh, pretty good ones and threes, pretty solid power in the jab. And he'll go to the body, go to the head, starts to let some combinations go once he once he gets into rhythm a little more. And he showed some pretty solid takedown defense as well in that Motor Reese fight. Um, wasn't bad in the clinch either. You know, he's a strong guy. Uh, Derek Weaver, kind of an up and down career. He's seven and seven. I think, you know, his hands are a little bit low at times in the stand up. And I feel like Waldo is going to be able to, to land clean on him a couple times in the exchanges. I also feel like just defensively in general, uh, Weaver leaves a little bit to to be desired. But, you know, he is a big guy. He does have knockout power. He's knocked out a bunch of guys. So anything can happen, you know, kind of lower level heavyweight fights. Haven't seen a ton of grappling from him uh, against the fight. And, you know, against Chandler Cole, he didn't look amazing in the grappling. Uh, but, I, you know, I kind of doubt this fight goes to the ground very much. But I'm going to go with Waldo Cortez Acosta here. I just think he's the more polished striker. I think he has a, a more wide arsenal on the I think he's a bit cleaner in the boxing, and I could see him getting this one done with a knockout. I'm not super interested to bet this one at, at the pretty tilted line. He's like minus 550-ish, I think. So yep, I'm minus just five from this. Yeah, minus 550 plus 400 on Weaver. Uh, yeah, it's it's just a, it's a pass. Although I mean, I'll probably do a Wal- Waldo, you know, Waldo and Jones. I'll probably add to like one or two parlays. But yeah, for the most part. Leave it alone. Um, I do think he gets the finish most likely, though. So I'm just judging by the fact that Weaver's been finished all seven of the times he's lost. Um, but uh, next fight here, uh, this one's definitely one I'm, uh, I think is, yeah, I think the last three are pretty intriguing, honestly. Um, you know, these are, I think, the three closest fights on the card, which I guess when you say a minus 700 or minus 500 or minus. 400 is like very low bar to set, but still, I think this one's uh, closer definitely than people, uh, than the odds uh, that I've heard uh, think. Uh, James Wilson taking on Ahmad Sahual Hassan Zada. Um, that is a mouthful, but you know, I got through it there. Hassan Zada, uh, good, very good striker, long, lengthy striker at an international Hashafuru Federation. 6'1", uh, definitely stands out right away, 7'1", uh, for the Afghani fighter here, taking on the 28-year-old Kings MMA, Stanford, former Stanford wrestler, uh, James All Might Wilson. Um, pretty classic matchup here, the wrestler versus the striker, um, to kind of oversimplify it. But James Wilson so far really looking the part of a, of a good up-and-coming prospect, fighting on Kings MMA, the good camp, 4-0. 5-0, and oh, going back to his amateur career, definitely a very solid wrestler, um, Rafael Cardero, as well as Benil Dariush uh, in his corner, usually 5-9, 72-inch reach. So not the not a crazy reach, definitely going to be a reach disadvantage here. I just can't imagine he's going to be looking to keep this on the feet too much more than to set up the wrestling. My issue is he's faced uh, – Next to no competition, Daniel Jefferson, 2-2. Two and two. It will see that back in May with LFA 107. Got the decision there. Um, you know, dominated with the wrestling, mostly what he's going to do. Um, does have a couple finishes by punches, but mostly I think he's going to use the wrestling, get it to the floor, try to set up uh, ground and pound or a submission. I just don't see anything too different here. But if he's not able to get those takedowns, um, I do think Ahmad becomes a very live dog very quickly. Um, you know, 26 years old, won two straight. Uh, he's definitely faced uh, the better level of competition, not faced like a mind-blowing level, but still faced mostly plus competition. Um, he has fought in mostly just fight nights, Afghanistan as well as TGFC, and so not exactly too familiar with these nfg not super familiar with these organizations he had one fight where both guys ended up meeting each other and so they got no contest which was odd i mean he's had some weird results here um really i mean i like my i wanted to go with uh you know ramad asa um or hassan uh, zada i really did because i do think if he's able to stuff some of the takedowns all of a sudden this becomes close if not uh favored for him but 
I do think Wilson's going to be able to get in on those kind of longer, skinnier, taller legs, get those takedowns. Sometimes the height is a disadvantage. Um, I just don't see Wilson looking to mix it up on the feet, but if he has to, he gets he's in some trouble. So I do kind of see uh, some people sign with Hassan Zada, and I can understand that. I'm not going to be. I'm going to go with Wilson, but I'm leaving it alone. Yeah, Hassan Zada, good striker, likes to stay at range. Got a pretty good one, too. I, I like the jab and the cross. Pretty pretty good boxing. Um, and when he does, he gets to clean with that cross. He can wobble you a little bit. We have seen him taken down before. You know, he has decent takedown defense, but I definitely think at some point in this fight, he is going to get taken down. I don't think he's going to be able to stuff uh, every takedown that Wilson's going to attempt. He has been pretty dangerous on the ground over the course of his career. I mean, the guy has 100% finish rate. Um, and four of those are submissions. And Wilson, mm-hmm. you know, we know he's going to try to take him down as much as possible here. Um, I think that Hassan Zada is going to need to work to get up. But if he can keep this standing for two out of the three rounds or maybe even a round and a half, I think that he is extremely live in this spot. Uh, James Wilson, 4-0 fighter from Kings MMA, the former Stanford wrestler. Um, and, you know, he had those three wins on Gladiator Challenge. I remember talking about this fight uh, when he made his LFA debut. Um, he was coming off those three wins on Gladiator Challenge. And it's kind of tough to gauge how good people are coming off that promotion just because the competition level isn't great. And he didn't face, you know, the greatest guy ever in his LFA debut either. Um, but, you know, he went the distance with them, had a very wrestling heavy decision, uh, working with really good guys at Kings MMA. I mean, Benil Dariush, you've seen him on Instagram with RDA and Marvin Vittori. Um, you know, striking wise, I really don't think he should stand with Hassan Zada here. And I don't think he's going to try to uh, Jefferson in his last fights had some moments on the feet against Wilson. Wilson has been working on that Muay Thai uh, over the years, I know, and, and he is getting better in that aspect. But I see Hassan Zada being the, the better striker here. Wrestling is the bread and butter for Wilson. That's, that's really no secret. I think he definitely needs to work that wrestling to win. I think he probably needs to get, you know, at least two rounds of control to win here. And that's definitely possible. He's, he's a strong guy. Uh, but at plus 240, I kind of think Hassan Zada is too big of an underdog here. He's a slick yeah. fighter. He's got a 100% finish rate. And I think that if he can avoid getting held down for two of the three rounds, he's going to be having success on the feet. So I actually do have a small stab uh, okay. at the dog on the money line. Uh, I think he has the finishing upside in this fight. But, you know, I'm not super confident. Just a small half unit play. I just think the line's a little bit wide. Yeah. No, I was tempted. And, uh, I mean, I might, depending on the movement from here on out. But, yeah, plus 240, I think that's a good price. Yeah, I've got just edge towards the two rounds that – the control at this point, but that is one I'm kind of definitely one of the um, dogs I'm edging towards slightly more than any other, especially so far on the card. Um, last two fights here is kind of the unofficial flyweight Grand Prix. I'm not sure if they're actually calling it that or not, but I would think if these guys stick around after they win, they would end up fighting each other, whoever wins from these two fights. Um, but the first fight here, uh, LFA uh, submission of the year, KO of the year, and like fighter of the year nominee, Clayton Carpenter. I think from his three fights last year, they all got at least one of those nominees. So kind of crazy there. Um, super exciting uh, young prospect, though. Really seems to be pretty good just about everywhere. Going up against the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world champion black belt. Uh, I believe it's Vinzer. I don't know if it's Windsor or Vin- Vincent or Vincent. I'm going to go with Vincent. Uh, Hamos here, the Brazilian, uh, as I said, uh, definitely known for his jiu-jitsu here, but two guys young in their careers, 29 and 25 MMA lab versus Alliance here uh, in Checkmate in Charleston, Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, for Vincent. Uh, Hamos, four and one here, uh, turning 31 next week, or 30 next week, I should say. So uh, definitely a big point in his career here, four and one. I uh, had a couple grappling bouts uh, over the last year, last year or so to stay kind of active. Otherwise, uh, hasn't fought in MMA since November of 2019. Got a rear naked choke there. Most of his wins are going to come by submission for the most part. Uh, had a couple other submissions and then a finish with uh, by knockout. Also, be it he hasn't faced a great level of competition. One and two, zero and four, zero and one, three and six. He lost the decision to, um, so a little bit concerning there. One against a three and zero opponent in his last fight. Got the rear naked choke there with King of the Cage, so that's definitely good. But uh, it's kind of weird. The Carpenters had four fights since the last time that uh, 
Hamos fought, so definitely has the rhythm right now. A ton of positive momentum, too, for the 25-year-old out of Arizona here. Um, you know, 5-0, and explosive, getting finishes, got a knee bar, had a really impressive fight in his debut, and then the head kick knockout of Rodney Kiolohi uh, in 13 seconds. So he had a 45-second win and a 13-second win. Um, he's looked really good, but um, also those quick wins, we don't know. A lot also. You could come on and do that again, sure. But, I mean, for the most part, I think that uh, in this fight, I think it it is about if uh, – I think Carpenter can really keep this on the feet for the most part. I think Hamos is going to have to get this to Florida to really have a fighter's chance. But even there, I think Carpenter is going to be able to roll, scramble, and possibly even be the better grappler against a world champion, which is, you know, not the route I would suggest he takes. But if he, he can at least survive down there and make it competitive, I think. Everywhere else, I mark for Clayton Carpenter all day. A uh, little bit surprised in the odds here. I think this is a really good – uh, price on Carpenter and uh, yeah, I mean Carpenter and Jones right away are a parlay I love uh, for a little bit of positive Nemani. Um, but yeah, I, I like uh, Carpenter here. I'm not sure if he gets a finish or not. I think it's going to be a good test for him, but I just think um, he's competitive in the spots where Hamos might be slightly better, and he's much better in the spots where he is better. So I like Carpenter. I like the momentum, the rhythm. I mean Carpenter looks like a future. Uh, potential UFC competitor at the flyweight division. Well, I mean, we might as well just go right on to the next one. Cause you took uh, most of the words right out of my mouth there, man. Clayton <laughs> Carpenter, uh, five and zero prospect last three fights in LFA and his last two fights, easy to watch tape on them. Cause they don't even last a minute uh, yep. combined right. 45 second knee bar and a 13 second head kick. He's got four finishes in five fights training at the MMA lab. I BJJF world champion. Uh, junior Golden Gloves champion, four-time national Muay Thai champion. So, like, the guy's pretty good, right? I think uh, I think we could agree on that. Um, he's a well-built physically as well. He's really strong at 125. And Hamosh, on the other hand, is an amazing jiu-jitsu player, Nogi world champ, European champ, three-time Brazilian national champ, training at Czech Mat in South Carolina, um, four and one as a pro. And he had that, like, weird first fight where uh, he illegally need fired Muhammad and then, Muhammad recovered and then comes right back and illegally knees him. And uh, they both I was a, that was a fighter. I was getting their fights confused. I was getting Has, uh, Hassazada's fight confused with that. I'm sorry. It was Hamos yeah, yeah. That was uh, kind confused. of an interesting fight. And the ref was just yeah. like, all right, that's it. We're calling it. You're both getting disqualified. Yeah. Um, then yeah. they rematched and uh, Hamosh lost the decision. And Muhammad was three and six at that time. So kind of an iffy one. Then, you know, he wins three more fights, some early first round finishes. But you know, you mentioned it wasn't great competition. The combined opponent record of those three guys was one and seven. Uh, right. His last win against Anthony Canzano, that's a good win. Um, that was Canzano's first pro loss, and he actually is a pretty good fighter. So that's a solid victory there. But that was two years ago. And, you you know, you you said it. Carpenters had four fights uh, in that time frame. Um, I don't think Hamush is a bad striker, but I just don't think he's going to have that much for Carpenter on the feet. You know, if this does stay standing for three rounds, I just think that uh, – Carpenter's probably going to eat him up. I just don't see Hamosh having any type of striking advantage here. He is amazing at jiu-jitsu. That's where he finds his success. But I think a ton of his win equity is kind of getting it down early and finishing it early. Um, he is very skilled on the mat, but it's like, you know, Carpenter was an IBJJF champion as well. And I think that you, you mentioned he's going to be, I think Carpenter's going to be better in the stand-up and then at least be competitive in the grappling. You know, I don't think he's going to get utterly dominated in that arena so yeah i gotta go with clayton carpenter here i think he's much more well-rounded i think he is the better striking i think he's going to be competitive at least grappling <laughs> um and he's been much more active training at a really good camp in a really good room i like carpenter to win and yeah i'm, I'm also a little bit surprised that we're getting like minus 200 he yeah. opened up as a bigger favorite and money has kind of come in on hamosh uh, so I wouldn't be surprised to see Carpenter get a little wider as the week goes on, but yeah, I'm a little surprised it's at minus 200 right now, to be honest. Yeah, I am too. And I'm curious here, um, if Hamos has fought in the States, so I'm not, let me see where King of the Cage, because his other fights were in Brazil here. Uh, yeah, he did fight in Georgia in his last fight with King of the Cage. So he has fought in the States once before, so. Um, that that hypothesis is out. But, yeah, I'm just surprised by the odds there. But I found at points you just can find value with these uh, organizations, um, and sometimes it's not a trap all the time. Um, you know, and uh, I'm going to just uh, take the value I got there, go with Carpenter. I like him quite a bit. Um, 
both straight up and I'm going to put them in a parlay. Uh, brings us to our main event. Really, really good main event between two Brazilians here in Juicy A Formiga. Uh, Juicy A Formiga, I mean, we're, we'll go through his resume in a minute, but it's one of the best resumes in the division ever. Um, pretty crazy. Um, that he's fighting in LFA, but here we are. LFA's not, there's no shame in fighting in LFA at this point, I don't think. So um, it's, you know, it's uh, taking the Brandon Moreno route. Uh, they're going to show Brandon Moreno highlights throughout the night, being like, is Juicy A Formiga going to do what Brandon Moreno was able to do and work his way back through LFA? And I mean, I really could see a realm where that happens. Juicy A Formiga, who one of the best uh, flyweights of all time and still really solid. Take out Felipe uh, Buenas, uh, I think, is, or Boons, I think, is what we decided to go with. Uh, Felipe uh, Filipino is what I'm going to call him from here on out. So we got 36 year old in Formiga, nearly 37, taking on the 32 year old uh, Filipino. So Pitbull Brothers here for him. A uh, little bit longer and lengthy, lengthier of a fighter. Um, Filipino, he's been fun to watch tape on, man. He He's 11 and 5. Um, you know, I think there's a quite a reason for that after watching him. I uh, really does, uh, you know, fight a tough level of competition with ACA. You see a 7 and 0, 8 and 0, and a 10 and 1. Not going to even t- try to butcher those names, but um, all really solid uh, competition with ACA. And then I uh, took on a 20 and 8 Mikhail Cylinder in his last fight back in uh, September. It was a really entertaining fight. Cylinder, a pretty solid grappler himself. And, uh, Felipe uh, was just constantly going for crazy submissions at the sh- at the cost of his position. We talked about with uh, Jacoby Jones earlier position over submission. This guy is the opposite, as opposite can get. He goes for submissions. It works uh, often, but you know, again, you know, it's like getting to that higher level of competition. That rate is going to be lower and lower. But he got he got a pretty impressive triangle choke of a twenty and eight opponent in Sealander. Sealander is no Juicy A Formiga. I'll say that right off the bat there. So huge level of competition. He's stepping up here. He has fought a decent level of competition through his career, um, but for the most part doesn't have wins over those high-level um, opponents. Uh, he is able to go to decisions, uh, fight fights very close. He, uh, he's he got underrated, I think, stand-up. I think, uh, you know, you don't see a ton of finishes with the power, but um, you know, he, he, he will get kind of wild, kind of like a Brandon Roy Bell style of striking almost at times where he'll put himself into positions where he can get maybe taken down, but because he scrambles so much and starts working the jujitsu, gets a little comfortable with that. I just don't see that being a super successful route against a guy in Juicy A Formiga. Um, if you're here, you're familiar with him, but you know, 23 and eight, but 23 and eight with. Losses. I mean, his last three losses that got him out of the UFC, like real quick. It's Benavidez, Moreno, and Perez. Like, I mean, and uh, Benavidez. I think that was like the last to win for Benavidez on his, you know, or one of his last wins at least. Um, but has a win over Sergio Pettis, current uh, bantamweight champion at, at Bellator. Has a win over Davidson Figueredo, current UFC flyweight champion. So, I mean, the, are, these are super high-level wins here. Um, you know, the Perez fight was pretty bad there, the leg kick finish, but Perez has some of the best leg kicks in the sport. We'll be talking about him in, like, 20 minutes with uh, Norton, who's right here right now checking out the uh, podcast. But, yeah, I, it, it's one where I really was looking into Boones, I or Boones. I'll figure out how to say his name uh, better. Um, but – and I think it's going to be an interesting fight, but my brain just can't go away from Juicy A Formiga here. Um, you know, it is he is getting to that um, father time, knocking on the door, 36, 37, and flyweight. But he's kind of one of these flyweights who I do think can fight into his uh, later 30s with how he uh, does fight. He doesn't exactly rely on the athleticism. It's much more kind of uh, tactics. I think he's got underrated stand-up here, and I think grappling-wise – He's going to be able to kind of take the tricks thrown by uh, Filipino here. But, uh, you know, Filipino is an exciting fighter. This should be an exciting fight. But, yeah, for me, uh, I can't go with the dog here. I got with Formiga here. Minus 200, I think, is a great price on him. Uh, And I do think he's still very motivated to get back into the UFC. So uh, probably a win or two wins away from getting another opportunity in there. And 
should take this one against a fellow Brazilian, Brazilian and Filipino. Yeah, this is a, a really good main event for LFA, man. I mean, uh, if, if we take a look at Felipe Bunas, right, training at Pitbull Brothers and kind of by virtue of that, you get to go spend some time at Fight Ready with Captain Eric. And I saw that he was yep. getting some work in with Figueiredo. He was getting some work in with Risco Beck Ibrahimov, who we just talked about in the last LFA card uh, in that camp. And he's a finisher. He's got a 91% finish rate, eight submissions, uh, got off to a really good start in his career, eight and two, went over to Russia, got a round one knockout on Fight Nights Global. Goes to ACB, submits Yoni Sherbatov with a flying triangle armbar. Uh, next two fights, man, he gets really tough matchups. Two undefeated Russians, including Murad Magomedov, who's still undefeated to this day. Um, mm-hmm. Then in his next one, you know, he gets 10-1 and Imran Bakuev. So he's dropping three decisions in a row on a bit of a skid. But like you mentioned, Michael Solander, I mean, is a UCA Formiga? No, but he's pretty good. Uh, mm-hmm. He is a little bit of a step down from those other guys he was facing over in Russia, but still uh, finishes him with the triangle armbar in the second round. That's a good win. And He's definitely a skilled fighter, man, but this is going to be a really stern test um, in UCA Formiga. But, you know, the resume of Bunas, if he wasn't facing somebody with, you know, an amazing resume like Formiga, him coming into LFA, I'd be looking at that and be like, geez, this guy's fought like some pretty high level guys uh, compared to a lot of guys that we'll talk about in these regional shows. I think that Bunas uh, will be a little bit more willing to go first on the feed. I kind of see him being a bit on the outside in the stand up. I think Formiga is probably going to want to try to corral him towards the fence a little bit, try to get in on a shot. Um, Bunas could possibly have a little bit more success on the feet, but the thing that uh, scares me off him a little bit is, you know, in the fights that he loses, it's normally against those guys who he can't really get down that much, or he doesn't really have that grappling advantage. And I mean, Formiga is obviously, as we know, just an elite level, uh, elite level grappler, and he had an 87% takedown defense in the UFC. He's going to be really tough to get down, and I feel like those are kind of type the type of matchups that Bunas has a little bit of uh, of trouble with. Um, but it, you know, it, it's still interesting. I still think it's close. I think that, uh, for me, he, he doesn't have a ton of volume on the feet, but he's also been standing in front of really good strikers in his last matchups. Like the guys he's fighting, has he really lost to anyone that we think wouldn't be, you know, the champion of flyweight and LFA? No. I personally don't think so. And he's uh, taken a lot of time off from that last lot. I mean, he yeah. looked like he was coming into a Perez fight quite compromised. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's got good trips in the clinch, good double leg, good back takes, very solid defensive grappling as well. I mean, I think a fair concern is, you know, is he going to be as spry or as uh, athletic as he used to be? Obviously, he is getting up there a little bit, especially at flyweight. But, I mean, until I see it from what I'm seeing on tape, man, it's hard not to go with UCF Formiga here. I want to give Bunas his due because I do think he's a really good fighter. And if he was fighting somebody else here, I probably would would be siding with them. But, you know, we have two jujitsu specialists going at it. I just think Formiga has the edge. And he also just has extremely high-level experience that uh, Bunas just doesn't have. So I'm going with UC Formiga here. And yep. uh, I, I feel pretty good about it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, you know, I do I just, I do not think the LFA, not, you know, I know that with MMA, they can't set up like boxing or anything. But I don't think that the LFA is bringing Bunes in to win this fight necessarily or expecting him to. I do think they're expecting Formiga to. So tough, tough draw for uh, Bunes here, but I do think he has a good potential in his, you know, LFA run if they keep him around. So uh, I like Formiga. I saw a couple people say they don't think Formiga makes it back to the UFC. Oh, we'll see. You know, I mean, there's not a lot of flyweights in uh, the UFC, but I think for the most part, we don't really got to go through a quick picks on this one. I think we agree with most of the favorites. The James Wilson, um, Hassan Zada uh, line seems to be one that uh, we differed on, but, and I can understand that might be one I'll be joining you on, but otherwise I think we got mostly favorites here uh, for this LFA. Um, It's just kind of one of those where the favorites lined up for us. So, no need for the quick picks here, but uh, definitely, like I said at the beginning of the show, if you're not subscribed to Lucky Locks Picks MMA, subscribe to that channel right now. Um, really sustained breakdowns, like 15-minute breakdowns for the whole cards usually, much less of this kind of side and kind of the discussion and right to the point. So I really find it helpful as I'm going over my final bets. So definitely check out that over on the channel. Um, we're going to be checking out the – uh, PFL Challenger Series, and much, much more as we keep going. And in uh, about 15 minutes, I will be here with uh, Norton MMA, Lewis of Norton MMA, to cover the uh, UFC 271 uh, pay-per-view headlined by 
Whitaker and Adesanya too, tied to Ivasa Lewis and uh, Cannoneer and Brunson, amongst many other fights, 15 other fights. So 30 more fighters to talk about. Be back in about 15 minutes with that. But, uh, yeah, for Aaron the Dog, for Lucky Locks Picks, check out uh, MMA on Friday, Showtime FC also making their debut. Maybe I'll make a video. Uh, probably not, though, but we'll see. Um, and uh, LFA is at uh, 10 p.m. start time on Fight Pass, so a little bit later. Um, but, yeah, again, Anaconda Vets just making it here, but I'll have the uh, timestamps up in the comments, and I will be back in 15 minutes with Norton MMA for the UFC 271 show. Appreciate it. Giving some love to each other. Nice job, Lucky. I agree. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, man. Um, but appreciate it as always, man. Thanks for making the time. Thanks for the adjustment. Everybody else who uh checking out the breakdown, appreciate it. I'll see you guys in 15 minutes with Lewis. Have a good one, everybody. Keep taking care of each other and cash those.